yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, you know, really, really excited. This is our first webinar uh, and on this topic, which is pretty amazing. And I, I already see some amazing people joining us. So yeah, um, you know, uh, let's get started. Um, today, we are going to talk about future of prospecting. As you can see here, um, uh, I've got my notes here. So if I see here, like, um, you know, I'm just reading the notes. Um, uh, the main thing was, you know, why we decided to do this webinar, and especially with these two awesome people, uh, is because, uh, you know, we see that in this sales community, there are two camps already. Like one camp is saying, you know, outreach is dead. <laughs> the other camp is saying, you know, the outreach is not dead, like, or the outbound is not dead. If you follow the fundamentals, people still see results. Of course, the challenge that has happened, um, you know, uh, for example, a year ago when we started our own outreach, uh, especially going after mid-market enterprise, we were seeing like almost 0.01% response rate. And we thought, you know, this whole thing is, is useless. We should uh, cancel our outreach subscription and stop doing call uh, emails and calls and like find some other methods. Uh, we were like really, really frustrated. And then we started following some amazing people like, of course, Keith, Hamish and other sales leaders on LinkedIn. And we saw that, oh, I think we are doing something wrong here. <laughs> I think we are, we are, we are basically uh, doing tactics versus going after like following fundamentals. Uh, tactics like spray and pray, tactics like, oh, you know, this person changed his job. Now just reach out to this person and you will get your meeting and everything will be sorted. And we were like, why is this not working? And what we realized was um, in 2024, because there are like, like so many automation tools and like it has become so easy uh, to actually, you know, gather email addresses and accounts from tools like Apollo, Lucia, that almost everyone has started doing this, uh, smaller company to larger company. And so the, the volume of the outreach is so much that templates doesn't work anymore. And that is why we are seeing lower and lower response rates, <clears throat> right? And so basically what happened uh, was, you know, when we started focusing on sales fundamentals and, you know, we actually, uh, you know, learned about these fundamentals from, you know, of course, uh, people like Keith and Hamish. And uh, we, we started seeing really, really good responses. Uh, and of course, what we also realized Realize that all of doing all of this is really hard. Executing this and then training your team using the right tools and and doing all of this, you know, makes it complicated uh, and hard. And of course, when it's complicated and hard, that's when you know when you actually do it, you will see results. So so we we saw that, and you know, um, our email channel, which was almost dead, you know, started getting like one fourth of the meetings, um, you know, that we were booking this quarter versus three quarters before. Uh, in total, our our, our own uh, outreach uh, response rate jumped, like our meeting rate jumped by three times in the last three quarters when we started following these strategies uh, without increasing the, the volume of outreach. So here, you know, we thought we'll talk about these three interesting um, fundamentals of sales and and you know how can we leverage some of the some of the uh techniques uh that Keith and Hamish will talk about uh and yeah and then you know one of the other interesting thing we wanted to do was um uh, at the end to keep it really really exciting first of all you know these guys will share these frameworks so that you can use them but more than that you know after that what we also want you to do is you know uh, give us say five of your prospects and five of the accounts you are trying to trying to do out uh, trying to reach out to, and then we will we will get back to you with some very interesting uh, frameworks and very interesting outreach ideas that you can use just for these uh, five accounts and prospects. So that can be one of the uh, one of the things you know you can look out uh, from this uh, webinar. We want to keep it really really outcome driven in a way. Uh, so let's jump into this, uh, Keith Hamish. Um, let's talk about the first topic, which is hyper personalization, right? Uh, most of us see very low response rates, right? Like sometimes even less than one percent. Uh, so, you know, what do you guys think? Uh, you know, is the right way to do this? Um, 
maybe we start with Keith uh, or Hamish, whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go first. I, my first question, I know you have it on the screen, but I'm curious to know what types of responses that the audience is getting with their cold outreach now, whether it be email or phone, maybe what maybe what's your best channel right now? Maybe that's a good one to put in the in the in the chat. But for me, hyper personalization is not a couple of merge tags of you know putting in the person's name and company. It's really about understanding not only the persona, right? Who are you reaching out to? What are the problems that they are typically facing? Robbie mentioned some of the technology that is out there and there's some really, really incredible things coming out there, but like, don't feel like you necessarily need it. You could go look on their LinkedIn, on their company webpage, on a Google search. One of the things I used to do, I'm old, so when there wasn't technology like this, I would see where they went to school and I would Google their name plus their school. And I would find like people that had you know, high school touchdown records, or they scored the winning goal at a, you know, a college championship soccer game that I would use as ways to personalize the approach. And I would tell you anytime that I would do something super personalized like that, I would always get a response. Doesn't mean I got a meeting, but I'd always catch their attention. And people are hyper or uh, really passionate about family, sports, sororities, fraternities, things like that. So those are things that I would I would focus in and on myself. And then I would also learn about the company. What are the things that the company is trying to do? And making sure that I was reaching out to companies that were within my ideal client profile, which we'll talk about in a in a bit. But uh, Hamish, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add there on on that piece. Yeah, I mean uh it's 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 what I it's what I teach it's what I train 100. percent I got a lot to add. I think when it comes to um, when it comes to cold emailing, when it comes to doing personalization, it's just like just just for the life of me, show some emotion, be human, like treat treat your treat your prospect like a human, like you're actually having a conversation with them. Um, but you gotta show some emotion because people buy into emotion, but it has to be relevant emotion. Now, so many people like like use utilize an irrelevant emotion on LinkedIn and in outreach, and it just goes over like goes over the head of a lot of prospects. It's about doing the techniques that Keith you just said, um, whilst also pairing it with with patterns, like patterns in their like in their career, patterns in their content. Um, if you know anything about them, if you have any mutual connections, you ask people like, "What's this person like?" Connections, you ask people like. Um, what are they going to respond to and then targeting with relevant emotion that they're going to respond to like because if man like i i received 40 cold emails today before 9 a.m all of them same same stuff hyper unrelevant mm. no emotion trying to sell me another lead generation tool trying to sell me something that I probably don't need mentioning companies in social proof that have nothing to do with me, like relevance more than anything. If you can tie in personalization with relevance and then hoping the timing's right, then that's how you get deals done. That's how you get meetings done. But often the timing isn't right. But if you do target people with quality, emotion in your prospecting with tied in with personalization over time, they're going to remember you. Let, let me add one thing there real quick. So a real life example this is actually how Hamish got on Bullhorn, the company that I work with. And I love this story. I love this story. Got, you know, got some training with our BDR team is, as we talk about hyper personalization, our CEO has a, you know, a band with the other C-suite on in at my company. So Hamish ended up sending him a video with his band shirt on and explaining the value proposition and everything. But it was very personalized because he he knew that a passion of the CEO was playing music. Yep. And he got the person's he got the t-shirt, 
it was a great it was a great outreach and i think that was before we even met hamish when when you actually did that but that was before we met and um and stampede for example like boston's finest everyone out there should go listen to stampede one of the best covers of smells like teen spirit that i've ever listened to um funnily enough funnily enough keith one of the bdr leaders that was actually on that training i did was with was in in this call yeah, the lovely Erica Badger. Yeah, you can just tell you can tell everyone in the comments how good it was. Thanks, Erica. Invoices in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one question I would like to ask both of you after listening to the examples, like sometimes people get confused about personalization. So if you look at any template, personalization to them means you know curly brackets and something in between, right? And that's what people think personalization is. But listening to you guys, it feels like it is actually much deeper than that, right? And on that point, I have a question. Sometimes, you know, we we also, when we work with other salespeople, we feel that people are very shy of using these things. They feel that, oh, it doesn't come across as professional if I talk about anything personal. But listening to you guys, it seems to me like, you know, that is the most important thing. So then why do people think like that? And like, how can they overcome such thinking? Or why are they like, think, think like this first uh, is my question, actually. Can you rephrase the question for me? Sorry. Yeah, the question is, uh, people are thinking that the personalization actually means just like adding maybe their name or college name in the email versus going to the second or third level, which you guys are talking about, which is actually learning more about their their personal passions and then talking about that. And is that awkward? Like, or why does that work? Oh, okay. Can I answer this one, Keith? Go for it. it yeah, sometimes it is awkward. Like, of course it's awkward because you're like, you're basically mentioning things about a stranger um about a stranger to a stranger like it's it's of course every now and then you're going to get a negative response but 90 percent of people aren't going to give you a negative response but you need like you need to test the boundaries so that you can literally sound like have it be a point of difference to 99 percent of the people that are cold emailing them like for example like i once sent a this is like a long time ago and i've i've, I've definitely altered my cold emailing efforts since then you can go too deep. There is such a thing with getting too deep on the borderline of creepiness. Like once I like stalked someone's Instagram back 10 years and saw them in a My, a My Chemical Romance t-shirt. Now I reckon they were 16 at the time and I mentioned and they were like, what are you talking about? How did you even find that photo? That's weird. And yeah, in fairness, I look back on it, it probably was a little weird. Um, so you don't go back 10 years because it actually has to click in their brain what you're talking about. And if it's just like they, you found a photo of them eating a cupcake four years ago at a work event, you're like, how was that cupcake? They're probably going to be like, I don't get it. Like they need to be able to tie in the dots like you're tying them in. So like I said before, there has to be a little bit of a pattern there, a pattern in their behaviors. If they're talking about one thing over and over again, then fantastic, use that. Like I get a lot of personalized cold emails at the moment talking to me about sales psychology and talking to me about like positive emotion um in sales and that comes in and people do go oh, i loved your take on on this like psychological thing and to me that that's how you do it and that's how you get a response out of someone because you know that they're actually talking about something that they care about yeah it, for me it was there was two main things on why i switched from doing what everybody else was doing to trying something different one Doing the same thing over and over again and getting shitty results is not fun. And as a seller, like prospecting can be a grind. So for me, I was like, I got to make this fun. And one way to do that is, is doing, I almost thought of myself as like a private investigator, like, cause back in the day, we didn't have the technology that's out today. So like, I'd be going to, you know, Twitter, to Google, to the <laughs> website, just trying to find any little bit of information that I could use to stand out. Would it take me longer than just throwing everybody in a sequence and sending out? Of course. But do I have a higher probability of getting noticed because it's different? Yes. And that's why I continue to go down that road and, and why I try to teach the sellers on my team of like, 
thinking outside of the box, being creative is going to help you cut through the clutter of all the noise that's out there right now. Oh, 100% Keith. And it's just like you also, like 10 quality emails is always, always going to be better than 100 like terrible emails. The chances of getting one response of 10 quality emails is much higher than getting one response of 100 shocking emails. And yes, people are going to talk about like, um, like AI and, and utilizing tech and all of that. But at the end of the day, like people, you need to be a point of difference to succeed in this current market. And that is just putting a little bit more time into your outreach. Utilizing like, like I know we're talking about cold email here, heavily here, but like utilizing things like video, utilizing content. There's a couple of people on this call um, that utilize content incredibly. Like Courtney, for example, use it as memes and stuff like that. I'm all for that. And I think that's incredible. Yeah, what I would add to that really important is don't focus on just one medium. Make mm -hmm. sure you're doing videos, you're doing calls, you're doing LinkedIn messages and boy uh, but again making sure they're relevant they're personalized you're not spamming or pitch slapping people i will tell you i've gotten really great emails that i don't respond to not because i don't think it's a good email because i want to understand if this seller is going to actually follow up and i'll tell you the majority of sellers will follow up once or twice and i'll never hear from them again the last two sellers that got meetings with me there was probably like seven to 10 touches, emails, voicemails out. And like, it got to the point where I was like, okay, I've got to give this person a, a meeting. They, they are consistent. The messaging is good. So that that's another thing I want to point out. Don't, don't hyper focus on just one medium. Yeah. And also keep, keep in mind this. Keith is literally the nicest guy in the world. And if it takes, if it takes seven touches to get Keith to respond, the most kind hearted VP of sales I've ever met, then imagine if you just like come across the other 99% of the population, <laughs> like put some quality into it, people. Yeah. And, and talking about the consistency point, uh, Keith, like one of the interesting things we have seen is if you're all hyper -personal, personalizing uh, the content, but you're keeping it across the medium, like right? you're calling, you're talking about the same passions, you're, when you're messaging, you're talking about the same passion. It also comes across that you as a seller know your buyer versus some AI coming up with an interesting thing and sending an automated email, right? So if you're consistent with, with all the personalization across your channel, then you come across as more genuine uh, and you actually know about your buyer. So, okay, cool. Let's go to the second uh, topic, which is how do you prioritize your accounts based on uh, smart triggers and precise triggers? Uh, this is more about timing, but also more about actually knowing the accounts you're targeting, right? So, I mean, just to give an example today, um, what, what people do is, you know, they just go to Apollo or Zoom Info. They just have a basic filter of like 2,000 to 5,000 employees and like using this technology and using some very basic intent data, like, you know, they are searching for sales tools, right? And now you just have a list of 10,000 prospects and you put them in a template and you bam, bam, like all of those emails are gone and you get zero replies, right? So. So how can we look at account prioritization in a different way uh, such that we have the highest chances of uh, hitting the timing right and, and come across as genuinely knowing uh, a bias problem? How can we solve that? I, I'll, I'll start, Hamish. I'll That's speak right. more from a mid-market to enterprise type scale. For me, less is more. I've been doing this for 16 plus years. And even when I was a rep, I always felt like I never had enough territory. I never had enough opportunity. Like I used to, I'd be like one year I'd have 400 accounts. The next year I'd have 200. I'd be like, you cut it in half. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hit my number, but I was able to hit my number. And as I kept growing in my career, the less accounts that I got, 
and the more success I had, because I call it narrow, narrowing your focus, you know, go narrow to go wide. I would much rather have a list of 20 accounts that fit my ideal client profile. And for those that don't know what that is, is I'll look at all the customers that we've sold over time. How, do they look alike? Go find other customers that look like them because I know that we have success there. And tier accounts, we use an ABC model. A is, hey, this is my top 20, 25 folks accounts where I'm going to spend 80% of my time knowing what the org chart is, knowing what their problems are, knowing what they're focused on. Bs are, could be still good fits. However, maybe they're in a long-term contract, not a chance for them to leave anytime soon. And then C, C, think of Cs as like your practice. Like you've got a new script that you want to go work on and you want to go make a new cold call, go call some C's and make some mistakes because it doesn't really matter. They're not really great fits. Maybe one will turn over in the, in the time that you're in the territory, but use those as practice. Spend most of your time on your A's. Oh, I love it. I love it. I personally think that you should have way, like way less, way less accounts in your like, like ICP list. I reckon no more than 100. The reason being, I think every account executive, every salesperson, every SDR should be specializing so minutely into an industry um, so that they can always, you know, even in a downturn of market, they've got a list of 100 clients that they've got active um, correspondence with over a period of six months to a year, doing things like, if you're constantly talking to clients, like if we're talking, let's use like in Keith's, in Keith's world, it's uh, selling to it's field, like field recruitment firms. So like mid-sized recruitment firms, that's a massive, massive market. But in recruitment firms, you've got healthcare, you've got construction, you've got accounting and finance, you've got tech, you've got marketing, you've got sales, you've got so many, but you want to then niche down even further. And why I always suggest people should niche down, even if they're selling to recruitment firms, sell to just accounting and finance firms with 10 to 40 people that are located in New York. That list will go down to probably 60 to 80 firms. And those firms, you just hound. You multi-thread those. You find who the different leaders are. If they've got 40 to 60 employees, you've probably got three, four people in senior leadership. Get as many meetings as you can with those. You're then gathering information on all of these different firms and you just become a knowledge base for those. And it's so much easier to see trends and patterns if you're constantly talking to the same people over and over again because that information is valuable. Stuff that people can't always find online and can't always find in their outreach, that's the way to do it. It feels like Hamish is talking like it's 1980s and you have to basically go and build relationships with all the accounts you want to sell to because... <laughs> I feel, I feel like, I feel like that's a criticism. No, I feel like, you know, that's basically the fundamental, right? Like it's not that, um, uh, you know, sales, uh, as I said, like outreach is going to die, but you have to go back to fundamentals. And I believe that because in 1980s and 1990s, you know, getting someone's phone number was not easy. You had to basically call the operator and you have to first sell the operator to get to first person. Then you have to sell that person, get to the second person. So if you didn't do all of your research and just like, as you are saying, if you didn't hound these accounts and people, you wouldn't, you, you didn't have a chance, right? And just because now you have the email address of all the people in the company, it is not that you can just skip that fundamental thing of, of knowing those people, knowing those accounts and actually learning more and more about those accounts and, and basically getting obsessed with these accounts, right? So, so I feel that, you know, it's actually going back to maybe those times I was not there, but, but maybe they did it like that. Selling to everyone is selling to no one, Robbie. And that's the thing, like you, you have to be able to leverage tech, but then leverage the relationship as well. And you have to provide a sense of value to these people. They're getting hit up every day. There's a reason why only 35% of account executives are hitting quota now in tech. Because there's too much tech. There's even like 10,000 SaaS companies started this year. Like it's crazy the amount of solutions that companies have. 
And so that means the AEs and the SDRs within those new SaaS businesses have to think outside the box. Like you have to like go back. Yeah. Great. Keith, you want to add anything or should we move to uh, the last topic? I think the last tip I would say on the account prioritization, many of you may know this, but just in case, a lot of people and a lot of leaders will say, well, you got to go to the top. You got to call the, the C-suite. You got to get in there first and they'll push you down. I will tell you, that's a great strategy if you can make it work, but you're also greatly diminishing your, your chances because those people are so busy and there's so many layers in between them. Don't be scared. I, I like the go low to go high. Every, every solution that happens within Bullhorn usually starts at the ground level, starts sometimes even at a user level that goes to the manager, then to myself, then to my boss, then to our CRO. It never starts as a CRO, never. So don't be afraid to start to build some alliances down low that can build some influence and get you to other places within the organization. A hundred percent. Like, honestly, if you're cold emailing a CEO or anyone in the C-suite and it's a big enough company, that email is getting seen by the EA. Yeah. And it's, if it, it's probably going to end up in a spam folder or it's probably going to get end up getting rejected from the system and then you have a bad domain. Like, build relationships with peers. Get in that way. Like, we, like he said, like, go low to go high. hundred percent agree. And, and this is true. My last question on this is like, this is true whether you're calling or emailing or doing LinkedIn, right? Like the, the method doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Like, uh, honestly, if you're using LinkedIn on a daily basis and you're not connecting with middle management at these firms, whoever you're trying to sell to, you're not connecting to middle management, like that's where your champions lie. Like that's where, like that's where you're gonna get the people that are gonna help you push the deal. Like, and then you add a couple of like Erica just said in the chat, like individual contributors, like a hundred percent. Like they've got a lot more time on their hands, and they're willing to willing to give you a bit of time. Great. Okay. Uh, let's move to the last section. And after this, we'll, we'll uh, also uh, open up, you know, for questions. Um, so, uh, you know, this is where you will also get a lot of value. Um, you know, what we wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, some of the interesting frameworks and, you know, we have been using some of the frameworks, which you guys talk about, and, and we have seen a lot of success with that. The interesting things about frameworks is that, you know, frameworks are not like templates. So one of the biggest difference is like frameworks, you cannot just use curly brackets and replace something with something, right? Like, so if a framework like Keith's talk about problem shift and answer, you have to do your research to actually understand the problem, potential problem of the, the buyer, uh, you know, the shift that is happening in that person's or com company's industry. And then what is the answer to that shift, right? So uh, framework, you cannot just replace with like one line of code and it basically has hundred different type of, can send hundred different type of emails. You have to really understand uh, the fundamentals uh, while leveraging frameworks. So this is, uh, this is going to be a very interesting uh, topic. Um, Keith, you want to walk us through first? Yeah, do you wanna go ahead and click on the link and we'll talk through some, just, and you guys will get a copy of this, a couple of different email templates that I have created with my team and that we use. And it's, it's, it's a way for us to think about the structures of emails. So the first one, I call it the PSA framework, it's problem shift answer. And you'll notice that all the frameworks that I do are using a mobile device because the majority of emails today are being opened on a mobile device. And if you don't know what they look like, it looks very different than what you're writing on a desktop than what it does look on a phone. And if it's jumbled, looks like a bunch of text, you're, you're missing an opportunity there. So you'll see a lot that it will fit on a mobile screen. It'll be less than, you know, a hundred words. And you'll see that I use white space within just to make it easy to read. So this first one always, it starts with a problem. I, I want to, going back to Hamish's, starting with emotion. I want, I want something to elicit 
some type of emotion based on a problem that I know that they're facing? And then what is the shift that's happening because of that problem? And then what's a potential answer? Not necessarily the answer. So in this case, I referenced a report. Last year, our industry was in the tank and there was a significant shift in the way that business owners started to operate their business. I shared how other people were being able to do that without adding additional headcount and ended with an interest-based CTA versus a, do you have time to talk, right? I wanna see if there's interest first, before asking for time, because I haven't earned the right to that. If we go to the next one, so I call this one the teacher framework. So as humans, we inherently like to learn new things. This was based off of, if anybody's familiar with user gems or Champify, that was the, the customer that I had, or the company that I had in my mind when I built this. So teach them something. Then answer the so what, like, why should they care? Like, okay, 20% leave, why? Well, that means if your competitor finds out before you, you've got an at-risk customer and you're gonna miss a net new opportunity because as we know, it's easier to sell someone that you've already sold before than someone that's brand new. And then what's, can you add some type of value? Well, if you sell a tool like that, you can probably see people that have recently just left. So you may wanna say, hey, by the way, uh, you know, John and Sarah just left. If it's of interest not to let this happen again, we should probably find some time to talk. So that's the teacher framework. And I think of one more. So if any of you guys follow Brian Lamana on, on LinkedIn, he is a friend of mine and also an AE at Gong. And he's got the ops framework. So it's an observation. So something that he found in his research, what is the problem that this customer might be facing? And then some type of simple CTA, like again, back to an interest-based CTA and then finishing with a PS, which is again, something personalized that he saw throughout his research. Now, what I would say is no matter what framework you use, one email is not necessarily going to elicit a response. You still gotta do the follow-up. You still gotta be able to do different mediums. But I will tell you from what Robbie told me was that the, that first one, PSA framework, when you guys started using it, really shot your emails up or your response rates compared to what you were doing. Is that, did I catch you that right? Or am I just? Yeah, exactly. Adding? Yeah. Yeah, we started booking meetings from email, which was not happening before at all. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Uh, Hamish, you want to add something here? Uh, let me just go to this. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the OBS framework. I I like the PS um, towards the end, and it can be quite effective. The only problem I have with having the PS at the end is that the personalization isn't the first thing that they see. And I think when uh, when you're sending, um, as Keith said, you're sending to, to people on their mobile, and if they've got notifications, it's going to show up directly on the screen, uh, and you're going to see... 11, 12, 13 words. So you want to make sure that those are words that are good enough for them to open the email. And again, on, on the desktop, it's the same thing. It shows up in your email. There's a little bit more words. It's about like 17, 18, depending on how big your screen is. And then you want to make sure that that is enough uh, to open, open the email. But yeah, no, those are good. I like them. Do you want to start like some of your, uh, sorry, sorry, Keith, yeah. No, I was just going to say, like, as a salesperson, you should always be testing new things, mm -hmm. right? I, I could have something that's working really good, but if I don't test other things, I wouldn't know if there's other things that are actually going to give me better results than what I'm doing. So don't be afraid to experiment. Go make mistakes. That's how you learn what works and doesn't work. Don't get uh, so focused on just using one particular strategy. But when you do find something that works after you've tested some things, then I would double down and, and continue to refine that. Yeah. yeah. You've got to A-B test everything. Hamish, you have some interesting like video outreach frameworks, right? Do you want to talk yeah. about one of those? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, my, my favorite one is 40 second video. Um, like it's all about attention span. For example, like, like if you think back like 10 years ago, 
10 years, probably even less, five years ago, people would watch cooking shows to learn how to make a spaghetti, like a spaghetti, sorry. And like the recipe for that same spaghetti hasn't changed, but no one's going to listen to a, or watch a 22 minute video to describe that now. Like they want to do it in 40 seconds. They want to do it on TikTok. They want to see everything. They don't care about the person's face. They care about a bird's eye angle, looking at exactly what ingredients go in. Sometimes these, these videos can be like less than 10 seconds. It's just the attention span of people are like way less for learning a new thing. So when it comes to cold video, like I like to think that every 10 seconds in the video buys you another 10 seconds. And so the first bit, is always a bit of personalization that makes them curious. Um, saying something like mentioning something in their background, mentioning something that like matters a lot to them. Like I said, patterns before. Uh, the next 10 seconds is something that's of value to them. Like um, showing like what, how you can tie in something to their background, but not using words like, like I and me. Uh, the third one is something with social proof showing that you've actually got proven experience in that area to actually back up the value point. And then that fourth point is um, like a CTA. You're closing it off. You've got an ask uh, and a little bit extra personalization as well. And honestly, like you can churn these out. Once you figure out that framework, you can churn these out like repeatedly. Um, like the best that my team have been, have been doing is like one every 10 minutes recording sending out so honestly wow and the average cold email personalized cold email takes people like 15 minutes to write like it's really easy so like uh, my only question on that is um are these videos being sent like as email attachments or this is more like on linkedin or just for social media like how does that work um everywhere Ravi. so the way that cold video works um especially a lot of a lot of what these companies are doing is it's not an attachment um it's more or less um they send like a like a gif of the video which has a link in it and it's exactly the same um as kind of having like a an image on your uh like on your um signature on an email so it doesn't hit any of the like the issues of, of deliverability or anything like that but that's, that's how I send it. I very rarely, I'll very rarely do cold emails. I mean, I do, but they're, they're less effective now than they were like three years ago. I very rarely do a cold email as the first, um, first outreach because people get really scared of links more now than ever. People don't want to click on links at all. But if it is uh, like a follow-up email, um, proving value add, that kind of thing. Usually the second or third step is my... Uh, my cold video. Oh, this is amazing. Uh, okay, so let's move to the last part and then we will go on to the exciting part, which is, you know, how you all who participated today can see, can get value out of this webinar. So yeah, just bear with us for 10 more minutes. Um, let's talk about little little bit about, you know, how AI can help. Um, and, you know, I can start here because, you know, uh, we are lucky to have Keith as one of the design partners and, and also like one person we always go, go out for feedback. And we have been thinking about how AI can actually help solve some of these fundamental problems. Um, one of the interesting ways in which we think that, you know, because chat GPTs and when all of these LLMs came out, people started utilizing them more for again like okay templates i can i can uh, write a template and i can send thousands of them but with gpt i can now send ten thousands of them right so people just are thinking about okay this helps me write emails faster linkedin messages faster so instead of sending it to 100 people now i'll send it to thousand people and <clears throat> as we talked about all the fundamentals today what we believe is that you know there is another secret uh, power of these LLMs and that secret power is uh, reasoning capabilities and analyzing capabilities. And that is where I believe this helps more, um, especially the sales leaders and sales reps, because one of the hardest things in sales is actually utilizing these frameworks, utilizing these ideas, doing research on your, um, 
accounts and prospects, finding the right timing, all of that um, can, can actually be, uh, in a way, AI can help you with that, help you be, become more productive uh, and implement these strategies in a much more easier way than, than it ever was. Uh, so that is like one area where I believe that AI can help more than just writing content. Um, do you guys ha have any like thoughts on this or your viewpoint? Uh, I do, right? So obviously, you know, you and I have been talking for a while, but for the longest time, I was like, uh, I was like the the old grandpa, like, you know, this, I've seen the things that come out from AI. I'm like, I can tell that's AI. That's, you know, it, it doesn't sound authentic. It doesn't sound like a human. And there's still a lot of that out there. But where I started to see the power was the way that it can help to all of the things I mentioned earlier that I spent time manually doing, like, let me go find that this person did X, Y, and Z, or this company cares about Y and Z with certain tools out there, you can now basically aggregate that all like within a matter of seconds. So if I'm trying to reach out to Hamish, instead of me spending time doing the research, there are tools where I can click a button and I can see, okay, he went to school here. These are his interests. Here are some articles about seller.io seller and, and what they do and what they're focused on that gives me and cuts my research time like, to minutes instead of instead of like 20 minutes. So that's where I think is going to be super powerful for sellers and learning how to use it correctly because it goes back to what you said earlier, the fundamentals. If you don't know the fundamentals and you just go use AI and automation tools, you're just going to get shit a lot faster because you don't understand the fundamentals of sales and how to maximize the efficiency of your of your efforts. So I'm a big fan of where I see it going. And if you're a seller and you're not paying attention, you should be. Amish, you have any thoughts on this or in general about AI? I think it's, uh, I think AI is great. I also think it makes lazy salespeople even more lazy. And that's the biggest issue I have with AI is if you're not inherently trying to do a better job with what you've got already, AI has just made you think that it's going to make your job easier. And most of the time, you just sound like everyone else using AI if you're not leveraging it with other creative parts of your outreach. Yeah. No, I, no. I actually, yeah, sorry. I, I see that as an advantage for the, the sellers that are already doing things mm -hmm. the right way. Because that means there's going to be so much noise. They're going to get filtered out. They're not going to be in sales for long because we all know there's no shortcuts. There are frameworks and principles to follow that can get you where you need to be. But shortcuts don't exist. So that'll just weed people out and just make our emails look a lot better and our outreach look better. So I'm a fan of people sucking using AI. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always going to be people sucking in sales, but it's just don't don't be good and then start sucking by using AI. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think, um, you know, it's very interesting because no one actually knows, you know, how these things will, will actually, these technologies will, will affect the way we work. But one of the interesting ways in which we all can see this is working is if you look at uh, coding, for example, which used to be a very, very hard creative skill, right. And technical skill. It's not that, you know, it has replaced coders and now AI can like write your code for you. It is basically just helping them do the mundane tasks faster so that they can, they have more space to think about, you know, one layer up and they can, they can now, they can now spend that time um, actually building much more complicated and, and, and better solutions. So that is like one way to think about it, but yeah, you're right. Like there can be the other way as well, where everyone just gets too lazy and no one is doing anything actually. Cool. Uh, should we open up for questions? And yeah, I mean, 
just a little bit of plug-in but <laughs> you guys can subscribe to our newsletter where we also talked about some of these frameworks and we talk about some of these strategies uh, so i'm pretty sure you will find it useful um at the end there is some gift from us uh but but before that you know let's open up uh for questions um Hi. can i ask some questions yeah, yeah of course Sure. So uh, I'm very interested when you mentioned that large language model as a reasoning thing. So so I was just curious, curious, like instead of using it as a generative stuff, like how, like uh, what part of large language reasoning step is useful here? Yeah. So as, as uh, Keith was also mentioning, right, like, uh, we can talk about hyper-personalization, we can talk about account research and prioritization, right? But all of this requires a ton of work because you have to, first of all, let's take an example. Uh, say you have to reach out to an account, say Cisco, right, or Oracle. Um, and they are a large company, they do tons of things, right? Uh, and, and I don't know what you do, but suppose you, you sell like a recruitment software, right? Then what you're looking for uh, in Oracle is completely different from what a sales tool like us is looking for in Oracle, right? Now, my team will do a research on the same data in a very different way versus your team, right? So AI today, uh, especially any technology beyond GPT-4, you know, and Llama, and all these um, LLMs also have very great reasoning abilities. So they can look at that data and tell you that, hey, you can use this data like this to reach out to Oracle, and it will give me a very different analysis and tell me that, hey, you can use this data this way to reach out to Oracle. Uh, so that's how uh, we see that, you know, this is going to help a lot. So do you use like large language model to get those data? Like, uh, is it like proprietary data you bought, you buy from somewhere? Uh, very interestingly, like most of this data is already available right? Um, their news articles, it's all about keeping a track of different keywords, keeping a track of different sources of data, right? Like news, their blog post, their solutions page, their 10K reports, earnings call, right? There is ton of data. Just that, you know, before, before LLMs, you would have to maybe hire someone from BCG or McKinsey to do this analysis for you, and it would be pretty expensive and one time. You can now do this all the time uh, at maybe one tenth of the cost. Well, why why needing McKinsey? I'm just so curious. Like, uh, what, what kind of special thing they offer? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know, <laughs> but maybe you would need an analyst in your team, right, to to look at all this yeah. team. or or a, like top point one percent salespeople actually already do that. Uh, but that requires a ton of effort and understanding. Oh God! I thank you so much. Hey guys, um, my name is Anshuman. I, I head the sales of Smart. So we are a Zoom Info competitor, similar in line with uh, Apollo and Russia, what you spoke about. Uh, guys, I have one question. So we spoke about different kind of email templates, but uh, what about the subject line? What kind of subject line really works? That's the first question uh, which I have. And the second one is uh, how we'll know how much is too much. Because like my guys will send mails, will do kind of omni-channel outreach, but how much is too much? So I'll, I'll I'll one thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll yeah let Keith speak. <laughs> but my uh, and Hamish, my my only thing is we didn't talk about templates today. We actually talk against templates today. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I I quite frankly, um, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, and so much. Superman, sorry, on Schumann, yeah. This and Schumann. Way, how you went. Absolutely, go ahead, please. <laughs> and Schumann, um, lovely to meet you. Um, basically, you. in answer to your question, um, what the subject line is, keep it as simple as, as you possibly can. Don't put their name in it. Don't do any dynamic field. Make it look as, as boring as possible. Two words, max, short words. Keep it like six, seven characters long. Um, the next 
point is how many emails are sent. I mean, you got to look at your DMAC settings. You got to look at your your domain health, all those things. Um, I personally don't think you should even be emailing off your main your main domain uh, because you're just going to hurt it. Um, you're just going to damage it. You're just going to blacklist yourself. Um, otherwise, oh, like 50, 50 cold emails max a day per person. Gotcha. Gotcha. And what kind of metrics do, do your team follow, uh, uh, Hermes? In terms like uh, when you are going to target, probably if you are going to target uh, the West Coast or the East Coast, or probably the entire United States, if you're sending 100 mails in a day, what kind yeah. of response do you elicit from those? Probably like it's similar for your LinkedIn, similar for your call. Um, I mean, it depends. It depends the quality. You talk, are you asking me personally? I, I know you are an expert, so probably like I can get some insight from you, and probably a little bit about your team as well. Yeah. So basically, what you're what you're looking at doing is beating the status quo, and the status quo right now is like one percent response rate. Um, the open rate is important, but realistically, the response rate is the only thing that you should be looking at. If you can get a response rate up between more than 10%, you're doing a very, very, very good job. Like, gotcha. that's honestly, even nowadays, like if, you can, if you're sending 100 emails a day and you're getting 10 responses that are, that are not like F off responses, <laughs> I see, then I see. it's... Then it's, 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 it's good. And then the other one is the open rate, because if you're getting a good open rate, that means they're not going to spam. The open rate tends to be something that tells you exactly whether or not something's going to spam or not. Yeah. Ravi, what do you think? Uh, how do you have improved? Because you were not getting any kind of response earlier. And right now you're getting some kind of response out there, correct? So uh, what's, what's your uh, take on this? How do, how do you improve those rates? No, how he has, how he has seen it improving over a period of time. Because well, you, you were mentioning you earlier. Me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because okay. you mentioned yeah. through emails, you were not getting any kind of response earlier, but probably right now you're getting some kind of response, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, going back to fundamentals, as we said, like that's all we talked about, right? First was, you know, uh, actually hyper personalization, not sending, I mean, we can never send 100,000 emails. So that's like, Jeremy, you are a pro. I mean, uh, so yeah, going back to those fundamentals, um, hyper personalization and not just templatization, right? Like hi and name and like saw that you went to this college or this, this company, right? Not that, like really personalizing it uh, to the person. The second is like learning more about the accounts and actually uh, associating a problem that the, the account or the industry is facing. And like, that's why some of these frameworks have really helped us. The interesting thing about frameworks is that you really have to do the hard work to use the frameworks. You cannot just put it as a template. And so if you are interested, uh, Anshuman, like, as we said, like, just send us five of your prospects and accounts and our team. And then we, I'll also reach out to both Keith and Hamish to check those things. And we'll, we'll send you some examples based on your real Real, real accounts. Sure, we all do that. Oh, uh, all right, team. I gotta run to a three p.m. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, Thanks so much. Sure. Yeah. Feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. Bye. Sure. Bye. We'll keep it open for like two more minutes, right, Keith? Uh, if you're okay, and then we'll jump. Yep, I've got to jump in probably about thirty seconds for a three as well. The one thing I would also say about open rates is with Apple's privacy protection that's on like all iOS devices. You know, you could think you're getting a lot of great open rates, but it's really in the background. It goes and and basically, I don't know the exact. I'm a sales guy, not a technical guy, but basically makes it look like the emails are open, but it's really not being open. So I back to what mm -hmm. Hamish was saying. I really focus on response and reply rates more than open rates. Still important, but not as important as what they used to be. Great, great. Okay, I think we are at time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll share this presentation with all of you and, you know, this gift. So, you know, if you want to share your accounts and prospects with us, feel free to do that. And we'll get back to you with, with real examples on how to do the outreach.